This is the promise of church family. Uh, this is actually not even a very easy text. Uh, I am excited to be teaching it to you, but please know that this scripture, Matthew chapter 19, we're gonna read the promise in verse 29 and then look at the context because it is heavy duty. And I just wanna say up front that when we start entering into some of the, what I call the paradoxical teachings of Jesus, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And you know, if you wanna be greatest of all, you must be slave. You know, all these teachings are to capture us in the kingdom of heaven which cannot be bound by anything of man. It's to open up our minds to look through a window and see the principles of God's rule so that we're not bound by the principles of man's rule. So this scripture is meant to free us and it does free us. And you'll see that it has a very, um, a very specific target of where we need to be freed. And I'm just going to speak it up front. It's trust. What God is after today is a deeper trust. He wants you to trust him. That's the heartbeat of today's message. The heartbeat of today's message is that the Lord loves you. And he wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust his goodness in your life and for your life and that he has good for you and he has increase for you. So please hear the word from the Gospel of Matthew, the words of Jesus, chapter 19, verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children, or farms for my namesake, will receive many times as much, and will inherit, inherit eternal life. Lord, this is your word, eternal and everlasting, a promise for our lives to teach us to trust you, to live for you. O oh Lord, send your spirit upon us to teach us this truth so that we may live according to the promises of God, a victorious and abundant life. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as a student of the word and as a teacher, I read that and I say, okay, there's the promise, but let's read it in context. Okay, so what are the passages around it? So verses 27 to 30 is this section right here. So 27 to 30. So let me read Matthew 27 to 30. Then Peter said to him, so Peter is saying to Jesus, so Peter is one of the followers of Jesus, one of the people that's called an apostle, uh, one of those first disciples that's authorized to be a leader in the church. So Peter said to Jesus, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Okay, remember here, Peter is often a spokesperson for this group of people, the disciples, the apostles. So Jesus is not just responding to Peter who asked the question, he's responding to all the apostles and followers of Jesus. And Jesus says in verse 28, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, okay, regeneration is making all things new. To be regenerate means to no longer be the old person caught up in your sin, but to be a new person alive in the spirit. Re to, to regenerate something means to bring it to newness, to bring it to yeah, be born again. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the way we hear it spoken. But we don't often use the word, you are regenerate. You know, uh, so that's what that word means, to regenerate something, to bring it to life, to bring it to living. So, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what is happening here is that Jesus is looking to the day when the new heaven, new earth will be complete and all things are made new. Verse 29, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms from, for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. 
So there's the scripture. That's what our promise comes from, that Jesus is pointing to the regeneration of all things, the making new of all things. The, uh, it, some people like to call it the end times, the, thing, the times when all things are complete. But does this promise have application for today? Or is this just something that, hey, I know it's really hard now and you're going to lose everything to follow me. You're going to give up everything that's dear to you to follow me. But hey, one day in the distant future, you know, you're going to have abundance. Is the promise of abundant life only for some time down the road and this life just stinks? So deal with it. Thanks for following me. I think there's, I think there's application to today, not just to a hope for a distant future. But don't get me wrong, let's not discount the hope. The hope is important, the hope is huge. The hope of heaven, the hope of the new heaven, new earth is huge. And even though that's not my focus of teaching today, I want you to realize without hope, we're dead in the water. Okay, I'm gonna try to encourage you to live the faithful living today, but it's impossible to live with faith and love if you don't also hold on to the hope because the three theological virtues of the Christian faith are faith, hope, and love. Okay, you need all three. They're a quarter three strands. So do not discount. I think this is one of the problems in some of the contemporary conversations about making the word of God applicable for today is, is that yes, the danger is pie in the sky thinking, but without hope, there can be no life. Do not lose hope. There is a hope for tomorrow even when everything in this life seems to be a muck and not working out and it doesn't seem to be getting fixed anytime soon. There is hope. So that's a word that someone needs to hear. There is hope, don't lose hope. But how do we now apply this scripture not just to a distant hope that God will make all things right and give you a increase in the future for your decrease today, but how can this help us to live faithfully and lovingly? Now, to answer that question, I believe we need to go even deeper because Peter was responding to something else. And this is why, as a student of the word, you're always like, what in the world is Peter? Why is Peter asking him this? That means we need to go back and start with the teaching in Matthew 19, starting in verse 19, because Peter in verse 27 is responding to a very specific thing Jesus says. And this is the teaching of the rich young ruler. So, starting in verse 20, let me read this to you. Matthew 19, verse uh, 19 to 26. Here we go. Uh, verse 20 to 26. 19, yeah, here we go. The young man said, no, where were we? I, start, I got my scriptures wrong here. We're going to start in, ah, here he is. Verse 16, I apologize. Verse 16 of Matthew 19. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing, what good thing shall I do that I may... That I am, in, am I in the right place? Okay, good. Sorry about that. I'm a little... Woo. Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one... Yes, this is right. Who is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said to this rich young man, he said, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Now here we go, ready? Jesus is talking to this man who is very rich. And he said, Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, and the word there is perfect or whole, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? And looking at all of them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And then Peter said to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. So do you hear the context? 
I'm, I'm, I'm trying to intentionally bring you into the story so that I don't teach you something out of context. It's important that we see this. Jesus' response to the rich young ruler who was following the commandments of God, he was a faithful man. He was rich, which in the eyes of the Jewish community back then meant he had God's favor. Okay, it was an ancient way of thinking, and I think it still happens in our culture, um, that if someone is successful and if someone is rich, then they must have God's blessing, because otherwise, how could they be successful and rich? Now, that is not 100% believed anymore. I think <laughs> we all know there's lots of ways you can become rich and successful in today's world without being faithful. But back in the day that this was written, you would have been considered blessed of God if you had this kind of money, if you were rich and successful like this. And so when Jesus said these things to him, it was a scandal. People are like, what? If a rich person can't get into the kingdom of heaven, who can? And Jesus said, it's impossible for man, but not for God. And then Peter says, well, who can be saved? Who can be saved? Jesus is very clear, you can't save yourself. You can't save yourself. So P Peter started feeling a little insecure. You ever feel a little insecure about your salvation? You ever feel a little insecure about whether you're living up to what God's done for you, what he's given you? I think that's human. But Jesus has a good word for us today. Peter wanted a little clarification after hearing Jesus tell the rich young ruler that if he wanted to be perfect, he had to sell everything he had and give to the poor. And so the question here is, just like it is for all of us, was that a bridge too far? Was that, was Jesus asking too much here? You know, and Peter was like, I need some clarification because this feels like a bridge too far. This feels like you're asking of me more than I can do. Now, if you remember in Matthew chapter four, Peter had left everything to follow Jesus. Uh, so the scriptures say in Matthew 4, 18 to 20, now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. So what is Peter doing in this passage? Well, I think he's reminding Jesus that he did leave everything to follow him. And so verse 27, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? Peter wanted some clarification. He wanted to know if God is faithful to keep his promises to him. And what does Jesus say? Jesus said in verses 28 to 30, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the completion of all things, in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall all sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is a specific promise to these 12 apostles. This one we can't generalize. We're all not going to be sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? So you got to remember, some things are specific towards the person Jesus is talking to. So you're not going to get a throne and judge over, you know, one of the tribes of Israel here. This is specific to Jesus saying there are 12 tribes of Israel. There are now 12 apostles, Okay? And everyone who has left houses, now this is everyone, this is us now, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will, and will inherit eternal life. Uh, it's almost like that and will inherit eternal life is a tag on at the end. But the emphasis here is not on the connection between eternal life and the completion of all things, but that everyone in this life, everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much. And so, Lord, how does that apply today? And that's really what I've been wrestling with all week. We have this promise of increase. We have this promise of God giving us a family if we're forsaken by our family for following Jesus. And it made me think about the voice of the martyrs and the persecuted church. It made me think about when someone uh, in the Middle East in a persecuted nation leaves Islam or leaves uh, some other uh, religion in order to follow Jesus. Upon that person's baptism, 
oftentimes they're completely ostracized from their family, completely cut off from their family, and they have to come into the church. They have to get a new family. And in many cases, we see people being stoned or being uh, acid thrown on them uh, for leaving their family and their family's religion in order to come into the family of God. And so immediately when I was preparing this message, I thought of those real life, everyday circumstances today where persecuted Christians are experiencing the promise of church family in this kind of way. And so we need to be aware of that. We need to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. And I just invite you to get connected to some ministries like Voice of the Martyrs that help you understand the plight of the church throughout the world. Okay, and so let's pray for them right now. And then I want to bring this message into our context. Lord Jesus, uh, we pray for the persecuted church. We pray for those throughout the world and even in our own country that when they leave, their, when they, when they leave the, the belief system or the ideology of their parents or their families, uh, Lord, often they are cut off from their biological families and from their ways of making money. They lose their businesses. They're ostracized from their communities and they're completely cut off from being able to feed themselves, make money, and they no longer have a mother or father. Brothers and sisters, this is literally happening today around the world. So we pray for those brothers and sisters. They are part of our family, Lord. And even if we can't tangibly be there for them, we can pray for them and we can support ministries that are supporting these young believers uh, in persecuted nations and throughout the world who are risking their very lives, risking their families, risking their well-being, losing their farms, losing their businesses, in order to come into the relationship with God that brings them into the church. So please be with the persecuted church. Amen. Amen. Now, that may be an application for someone here. You know, that may be the issue. You know, for, for you, this sermon may be over. You're like, I am so concerned now and so caught up with these people where these women and men are being completely cut off from their whole support system. And if you would like to know more information about that, please contact me, contact us in the office, and we wanna help you get connected to how you can be praying and supporting uh, those ministries and those people. Now, as I thought about how this applies to us today here in Newcastle, Indiana, in America, there's a couple stories I wanna share that I think are helpful to maybe get the point across. So I wanna talk a little bit of my testimony that I wanna share about someone else. So during the summer and into the fall of 2003, the Lord pressed heavily upon my wife and I that we should leave the army and go into full-time ministry. So I resigned my commission as an officer in the US Army to enter seminary and full-time pastoral ministry. We left behind the security and the support of being a part of the military community, which is all I've ever known. I joined the Army when I was 17. It's all I ever wanted to do. And at this point, you know, when I was 28, I think it was, we were going on 20, I was going on 29. It was a big deal. Uh, to be thinking about leaving everything we had worked towards and all the prestige and all the security of it in order to go into full-time ministry. And it was amazing how blessed and loved and cared for we were by our local church for six and a half years. Uh, we had been a part of this church, had been members of this church, and when the Lord called us into ministry, this church wrapped their arms around us and cared for us in ways that I could just take up most of this service to share with you. But the bottom line was, in leaving behind what was secure and safe for my, my family in our career path in order to enter into full-time ministry, we had to leave behind the security and the prestige of everything I had worked towards my whole adult life and start completely over. And if it wasn't for the local church, we would not have been able to do that. It was our local church in Sunnyvale, California that made that possible. And that was the promise of increase for us. Now fast forward, in another time it happened in my life because we thought the Lord was preparing us to be a full-time army chaplain and to move that direction after leaving that season of being cared for in Sunnyvale, California. But as we entered into 2009, uh, we left Sunnyvale, California, not to re-enter into the Army, but to come to Newcastle, Indiana. And we drove into Indiana in January of 2010 after leaving 
uh, Sunnyvale, California before Christmas in 2009, and we arrived on a wintry, icy day. And guess who we were greeted by? We were greeted by our new family at First Baptist Church at our home uh, and work that had been done to help us prepare to come here. So as we began my service, our service as pastor of this church, we realized that the promise of church family and the abundance, the increase of what God would do for us was not only true in Sunnyvale, California, but it was also true in Newcastle, Indiana, 2,500 miles away. And the same is true around the world for missionaries who are sent. And the same is true as people answer the call of God upon their lives. We moved to a place where we had no biological family. All we had, we had no friend group. All we had was First Baptist Church. And we have found now, almost 12 years later, we have found richness and abundance and increase of friends and family beyond anything that we've ever had. And Kimberly and I know the truth of the Lord's promise. We know it as a family that left a full-time secular career that was moving towards retirement and leaving that behind to, and basically forsaking all the retirement and medical benefits that went with that to completely throw our lot in with God uh, to answer the call as a pastor. And what we learned is the simple truth that when God speaks to you and you trust that what he speaks to is true and you obey, he will provide for that which he promises. You know, God will provide for that which he promises. You know, and, and I know sometimes these examples of talking about the persecuted church and people leaving, you know, Islam or, or Hindu or, 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 or some uh, ide ideology, uh, you know, communism, leaving something behind in order to come and be a full believer in Jesus and, and to get baptized and to, you know, be a part of the underground of the persecuted church. And that sounds radical and something we can't relate to. But what we can relate to often as Americans is the fear of giving up some level of financial security, some fear of giving up like some kind of job or something that we've worked for that is safe and that takes care of, you know, I had a kid and, and I, you know, and all these things. And, and we're just like, that's too scary. I can't imagine, you know, obeying God. I, maybe I'm just hearing wrong. Maybe, maybe I ate too much pizza king last night. Something, maybe something's off. But when God speaks and God asks you and, and commands you to do something, the reality is the, the, the principle is trust and obey. The principle is listen. And if it's the Lord speaking, trust him. And he's gonna take care of it because God always provides for that which God promises. And that's a trust issue. We would not have experienced the abundance of Sunnyvale, California, if we hadn't been willing to leave our military career behind to enter into full-time ministry. It wasn't easy. We worked hard. But God always provided. God provided, not me working hard. And we wouldn't have experienced the abundance of you as our church family and, and friends coming here without anything. And now my kids have grandparents from the membership of this congregation that are such a blessing to them. And we wouldn't have new family members and a large church family if it wasn't for trusting and obeying. And I know that doesn't sound like a very fancy application to this promise. The, the, the principle of the promise of church family is trust and obey. Trust that God will bring increase. Trust that God will provide for you, that God will care for you, that God will take care and give you your heart's desire. God will do that because his word says he will do that. And yeah, it comes with some sadness. It comes with some difficulties, and it comes with naysayers. Every single one of those stories has lots of little sub-stories that, that could be focused upon. But I want to keep moving because there's a challenge in our culture, and there's a challenge for Christ followers of our culture, and here's the challenge. We have a need to control. Our culture, we have such trust issues when someone makes a decision we don't like, man, our minds and our hearts go to places they shouldn't go. 
You know, when a leader does something we don't like, our hearts and minds go to places they shouldn't go. We have trust issues and we have a deep desire for prosperity in everything. And I believe this control issue and this need for our lives to prosper according to our plans, man, that governs over our society and it creeps into our minds and our hearts and decisions and even in the church. God calls us to something that is so much more in the sense of the kingdom of God where the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And when you're willing to lose everything, you gain everything. But if you try to hang on to everything, you get nothing. You lose it all. This topsy-turvy, counter-cultural kingdom. Because God wants to increase us. But we have to be, we have to be willing to become less in the eyes of the world. Jesus promised this when he said in verse 30, the first will be last and the last first. You cannot work towards your own worldly prosperity and your increase in the kingdom at the same time. And so, oh Lord, may we be faithful and trust you that you will bring the increase because we're willing to give it all to you and trust you. You know, I don't know, Lord, what the applications you are bringing to people's minds and hearts right now but i know there are specific issues being brought to people's minds and whatever that specific issue is where there's an insecurity or a fear for tomorrow which causes you not to be able to obey god today i pray that the lord will give you a greater measure of trust a greater measure of faith so that you may obey his word and experience his increase because the Lord promises you increase. Trust him. Trust him. Let me give you a couple of scripture promises here. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Very, very common. A lot of people have memorized this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Right? Right? He will make your path straight. It's a promise, but what's it a promise for? It's a promise for don't trust in your own thinking about things. If it makes sense to you and it works out on paper, it may not be God. Because Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9 say, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Lord, we want to experience the abundant life. But Lord, we got to let go of our control to be able to experience it, Lord. Because as long as we are in control of making our lives work the way we think our lives should work, we're never going to trust and obey you to give the increase where it doesn't make sense. Lord, help us to let go of whatever it is that's holding us back from stepping into the places where it only makes sense in the kingdom and it doesn't make sense here in this world. Oh, Father, please rescue us and deliver us. And that leads to my final example. Powerful illustration. I want you to go to Acts 9 with me. I want to give you this illustration of a man named Paul. Now, we've all heard the supernatural part of Paul's story, okay? We've all heard the supernatural part of Paul's story, but have you heard the church part of Paul's story? Acts chapter 9, it's so important. But we're going to start in verse 19. Okay, the second half of verse 19, Acts 9, gives us a very different part of the Apostle Paul's transformation story. Here we go. Now for several days... This is the second part of verse 19, Acts 9. Now for several days, Paul was with the disciples who were at Damascus. He was called Saul at that time. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. Now if you don't know, Saul was a persecutor of the church. He was someone who was actively working against Jesus and his message until his radical conversion on the road to Damascus. That's all those verses, 1 through 19, bring us to this point. And so here we read this. Verse 21, all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on the name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. 
When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples, that means the family of God, took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. And when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the family of God, with the disciples, but they were scared of him. They were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus and he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord and he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews but they were attempting to put him to death but when the brethren learned of it they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus so the church Throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Now, we often don't read this part of Paul's story, especially in worship services like this. It's something you would do in your own Bible study time or in a small group. But I wanted to emphasize to you the part of the story we always read is the supernatural, amazing moment where Jesus reveals himself on the road and he strikes him with blindness and then he's healed of his blindness and scales fall from his eyes. And we're like, wow, look at all that supernatural stuff that's happening in Saul's life for him to become a faithful follower of Jesus and then be in full-time ministry now and go and travel. But did you see the, what really allowed that to happen? What really allows it to happen is not just the supernatural conversion story, but it's the relationships in the local body. It's even when there's mistrust because of his past, there's there's Barnabas coming and saying, no, let me testify to him that he's a changed person. It took the community of God, it took the family of God, it took the promise of increase that Jesus said that you would lose your life, but then you would gain it if you listen to me, if you Trust me if you obey me. And that's what Paul did. Paul left everything behind. Paul left being the man (laughs) of everything he had built. And I in no way compared to Paul. No, no possible way. But I think to myself, Paul had to leave behind, you know, all of his educational training and his credentials to become a Christian And then it took the support of the Christian community to build him up to then be the missionary and the person of God that he was. And I think I had to kind of do the same thing. Everything I'd built my life and my prestige and my reputation around had to be left behind because it didn't have any value for the kingdom. And Paul says this, Paul uh, Paul says this in Philippians 3, and, and I hope this now puts it in context. Paul lost everything he had built his old life on when he followed the way of Jesus. And that new life had to be built not only in the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit through a revelation of Jesus Christ, but through the family of God, through the church. And this is what Paul said. Philippians chapter three, verses four and seven. Powerful, powerful. I hope you get this now. This is the context. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh... I far more. So in the eyes of a religious world, Paul had more more creds, more credentials than anyone. Paul said, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as the zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. He was a Jew of Jews. He was the top dog. He was working his way up the ladder. He was gonna be the man in that culture that he wanted to be known in. I totally get that. I totally get that. I totally get the desire to work your your resume and your credentials to such a point that I am going to be the man in America. I'm going to be a top dog, and I'm going to, you know, do all these things so that I can be a person of power and influence one day. And I'm going to work my way there. But then you get, then something happens. What happened? What happened to Paul? This is what Paul says, verse seven, Philippians three. Listen to this, listen to this. This is crazy, but I get it. And I want you to get it. I've lived it. I want you to live it. But whatever things were gained to me, 
those things I have counted as loss for the sake of, for the sake of Christ. I don't know for how long you've been building your life to get to some pinnacle of power and success and control. But when Christ steps in and he says, are you willing to forsake it all so that I can use you powerfully in ways that you can't even imagine? He said to Paul, I'm going to show you how you're going to suffer for me. Paul's like, okay, good deal, let's do it. Because he wanted to be faithful, because he knew this was the one and true God. And if that meant suffering, if that meant losing everything he had built his life around in order to follow Jesus, he was willing to be all in. And the Lord brought increase, and the Lord brought favor to him in ways that were beyond anything the world could have done for him. Paul's heritage, Paul's station in life, Paul's status, Paul's reputation, none of those things were worth keeping if it meant forsaking Christ. Because when Christ calls you to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow him and then you'll be made perfect and in your heart you're like, but I can't do that because that is my God and I cannot stop worshiping that God to worship the one and true God. Then God says, you're invited to know me and to trust me. And that's why Peter was like, oh my goodness, you, did you just really say that to that rich young ruler? You want him to sell everything he has and gives it to the poor? But I've left everything. I've left everything to follow you. I've left everything. Is that enough? He said, it's impossible for man, but it's not impossible for God. He says, I'm going to bring increase to your life and, and the regeneration of all things, but I am going to bring abundance to your life today. And these are not empty words. Paul had to leave everything. Peter left it all behind. They gave it up so that they could receive the abundance of the life of following Christ. When Paul answered God's call upon his life, God brought the promise of increase to his life through the church and in the kingdom of God. But from the eyes of the world, he fell from grace. In the eyes of the religious community, he fell from his pedestal to lose everything he had built towards. But here's the deal. Paul was no longer looking at the world to define his success. And I think that's where we as a church need to hear from God today. We cannot define success by the things the world defines success by. Peter gave up everything Paul gave up everything, and one of the hardest things to give up is your mindset on what a successful life is. Because you can't live for the kingdom wholeheartedly and keep striving for the success you thought was everything this life was about. And the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. You see, Paul no longer found all those things that he had devoted his whole life to is worthwhile because the first had become last and the last had become first in him. And this could be your testimony too. Because when you trust the promises of God to bring the increase to you, to bring the support and the church family around you, you will trust God enough to be willing to listen and obey to what your next step of faith is. And brothers and sisters, I have no idea what your next step of faith is. And it's not my job to tell you what your next step of faith is. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. I am here to tell you today, though, is do not let anything stop you from taking the next step of faith. Do not let anything stop you from taking the next step of faith because the, the, the application of this message is trust and obey. Trust that when you step out into what God promises, he will provide for you every step of the way. Just trust him. Trust God. And this will be your testimony. Your testi testimony will be of a person who trusts God and watch God answer prayers and watch God move mountains because all he asks of you today is to walk in faith to take a step of faith. Matthew 16, verses 24 to 25, Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his Christ, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's the words of Jesus. Let me open up the Bible and read that to you, just in case. 
just in case that will help you, because maybe you thought that was just the last preaching point. That's not the last preaching point. That's just the last scripture, and that's the end of this sermon. But I want you to hear it from Jesus. Emily, could you come on up and start preparing to lead us in response to this, because we need to respond to this message. I encourage you to respond to Jesus' words. Matthew 16, 24 to 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, that's you, by the way, you are now his disciples. You are followers of Jesus. You are Christ followers. You may see yourself as a cultural Christian, as someone who's just visiting you know, a church and trying to figure out what this whole thing is about, but I believe in the sovereignty of God's grace that if you're within the sound of my voice, that you are being invited to get into the easy yoke of Jesus and learn how to find rest for your soul by believing him and trusting him at his word. And he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. O oh Lord Jesus, the words of Jesus, the words of God given to us as promises for us to listen and obey. And that is my call to you people of God, to the family of God, to the church. You are part of the promise. You are the church of Jesus Christ. And without you, so many men and women would be unable to answer God's call in their life because you are the way God answers this promise. You are called to this promise and you're the answer to this promise. You are both because God uses you to bless those who are willing to leave it all to follow. And you're also the one called to leave it all so that you can be generous and supportive and prayerful and in the areas of your life to make sacrifices that may look like foolishness to the world, but are wisdom to the kingdom. So may you trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen.